Okay. Uh, um, questions about anything before I get started? Okay. Why not? Okay. Why not? Uh, so, yeah. Um, I actually met Klein as well, but in, uh, so this paper they were reading was published in 1968, Systemology Naturalized, which actually is after the Putnam paper, but I, I think of Putnam as after Klein, because Putnam is from a younger generation, right? So like Putnam was, was um, one of my professors when I was in grad school, and, but Klein was still around, but he was like Meredith. He was pretty old. <laughs> uh -huh. So, uh, um, I mean, in another way, I guess this 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 seems this seems kind of epistemology naturalized seems kind of early because the only part of Carnap that Klein is interesting in talk, interested in talking about is the alpha for reasons I'll about to explain but so it's like in a way this comes before the methodological character paper also because it's like Klein just uh, doesn't think that the later development of logical positivism Oh, what else can I say about this? Klein, so Klein was Carnap's student, sort of. I mean, he actually went to Austria when, when uh, Carnap was in Vienna. Klein actually traveled to Vienna and stayed with the Carnaps for a while in order to like absorb his <laughs> Rizzo. And uh, when Carnap came to America, there's kind of a famous story about, about um, I don't know, it's not really a story. It's like an impression that people had of Klein kind of like triumphantly leading Carnap into the American Philosophical Association. And, like, you know, like that's the end of all your nonsense. We've got Carnap here now. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, so he was, you know, in a way, a follower of a Car of Carnap and a promoter of Carnap, but he also, as you can tell from this, kind of turned against them in a way that actually Carnap found really upsetting but on a personal level. I think. I mean, there's a story about, you know, them speaking at a uh, at a conference or something, and Klein uh, saying that what Carnap was doing was metaphysics, and Carnap like. Crying. <laughs> so, all right. Anyway, um, that's just kind of the. And well, I guess I should say one other thing about Klein, which maybe I'll get to say a little bit more about at the end. Or actually, did I mention? I don't think I mentioned this in lecture before. I think I talked to someone about it. I'm going to talk to Ryan about it after class. But maybe I did mention it in lecture. But anyway, the Klein was actually pretty conservative. That's something I know about him. He was, you know, he was like supported Nixon. And uh, uh, I've never, I don't know exactly what the content of his views were. Apparently, it doesn't like come out explicitly in any of his philosophical writing. So apparently, you have to like read the letters that he used to write to the Boston Globe. But I don't really know how to find this. So, um, I probably should, should should look into that someday, but so I mean because it's important because conservative or like right wing can mean a lot of different things, right? I'm not sure exactly what, but I can guess based on the analogies with the philosophy. Which again, maybe I'll say something about it then. All right. Um, um, but for the most part, I'm gonna. There's basically two parts to what I'm gonna say about this. First, I'm going to try to explain the details of Klein's argument, or at least the main argument, right? I mean, there's a lot of different things going on here. Um, and then secondly, uh, try to address the question of what kind of argument against Carnap is this actually? 
because like because when you when you similar to things that I said about Goodman and some of the other responses we read that like Nora even and uh, Putnam that you know when you uh, when you really think about what Carnap is trying to do it seems like the criticism isn't exactly fair so that so like every time that comes up I have to address it basically so um right um okay but first of all just this is like part one what is uh just what is Klein's argument here so I mean so the paper obviously is about epistemology naturalized naturalized means well, naturalized means made part of natural science or something like that. Um, uh, this was this title here was the origin of the vast industry in naturalizing X, Y, Z, recent analytic philosophy. Um, maybe the popularity of that has passed. I don't know, but anyway. Um, uh, but of course, naturalized also means um, like uh, making a foreigner into a citizen. Um, but okay, but I'm not going to talk about that yet. So anyway, so it's about epistemology. Um, and what, so what is epistemology about according to Klein? Well, it has two sides. It has a conceptual side. Right. Doctrinal stuff. And this, now I hope it will become clear why at the beginning of the course I emphasized so much the difference between concepts and propositions, right? Because um, it's not just something that Carnap is interested in, in the alpha or the methodological. Uh, character paper. Here, here's the same distinction turning up in Klein in this discussion of what epistemology is. This is about concepts. And it's about meaning things. Concepts slash terms, right? <laughs> a term, this term is actually a term of <laughs> Aristotelian logic. You know, uh, proposition, an Aristotelian proposition has two terms. The term means like the end. Although it's actually not clear whether it's called terms because they're on the end or because it's like the end of division, like the simplest parts or something like that. That also has to do with the question of what to say about this, is that a term? So, like in the Middle Ages, they call this a synthetic grammatic term. <laughs> All right, but never mind that. So, right, forget about the copula. You know, the two terms are the subject and the predicate, and the subject and the predicate of the proposition are concepts or words that stand for concepts, right? It's like, Roses are red, so the terms are rose and red. Um, right, so this is about concepts or terms, that is, words that stand for concepts, and it's about meaningfulness. Um, so, uh, and um, 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 in particular, Quine says that like the aim of the conceptual side of epistemology has been to you know introduce to transmit clarity and distinctness of meaning. 
from one set of terms to a larger set of terms by using definitions. And then there's the doctrinal side. So the doctrinal side is um, um, it's about propositions or sentences. And uh, and it's concerned with truth. And again, it, um, in particular, according to Quine, it's about transmitting certainty. It talks about all these things, which are not nearly exactly the same, but self evidence or obviousness from some small set of sentences to some bigger set of sentences by means of proofs. So this is the same, basically the same parts that the Carnap says an axiomatized system has, right? This is the constructional, what Carnap calls the constructional system, and this is what he calls the deductive system. So, um, so Quine is saying, you know, that, that, that traditionally the aim of epistemology has been to set up these systems so that we can, you know, like get all our terms to be clear and distinct and all our sentences to be uh, certainly or self-evidently true. Yeah, it seems like I'm frozen in the Zoom thing. All right. Um, sorry, where was I? Uh, Right, so according to Klein, the project of the reason traditional epistemologists were interested in these two uh, types of system was because the project was, uh, well, that basically, if you could do this, then you could um, uh, translate all our sentences into sentences that were perfectly clear and distinct. And then uh, it would be clear how to prove them from sentences that are obvious, if, if possible. Or at least he says uh, it, would make more, it would make it more likely that we could prove it. So there's like a two-step plan. Number one, take all our sentences and you know, by using definitions, this again, this is basically what Carnap calls the constructional system. By using definitions, uh, take take all our sentences and replace all the somewhat unclear terms with clear and distinct terms. Um, and then once you have that, all our sentences all clear and distinct, then you um, you know take the ones that are self-evident or obvious and. Um, you should be able to prove the other ones from this. Um, so, you know, I mean, I guess I said I would talk about this second, but I'm going to just raise the issue immediately. Um, these are the two parts of an axiomatic system, according to Carnap. But is is Car is Klein's reason the reason Carnap is interested in axiomatic systems? So, like, um, there are two reasons to, to doubt that immediately. One is that Carnap thinks that science is already sufficiently clear. Right? I mean, remember, that's, you know, like we learned our attitude from us by associating with, with physical scientists, especially. We learned, you know, from their clear use of language, their clear and responsible use of language, right? So, um, 
Uh, and number two is that he thinks that empirical science and not philosophy is responsible for finding out what's true. So, I mean, I, you know, I pointed out that, like, in the Aufbau, for sure, Carnap is not, and Quine is going to address this, but so, so in the Aufbau, for sure, Carnap is not engaged in a project of proving that certain things that we think on the basis of science are true. Right? On the contrary, he takes for granted certain results of science and uses them to set up the system. But, you know, I mean, but from the fact that he does it that way, I think you can tell that not only is that not his project in the alpha, but that's not ever his project, actually. Like, he doesn't, because you can't set up the system until you ask the scientists what's true, it's just um, not going to be, uh, at least not in any straightforward way, a method of proving that the results of science are true. So you have to take them for granted in order to set up the system in the first place. So it's, you know, um, so, so something fishy is going on here. But on the other hand, Quine's story kind of makes sense. Yeah, like if you could do this, um, then yeah, it would make it easier at least to see if you could do this. <laughs> So then Quine tells this story, it's like a history of philosophy leading up to the alpha. But it's a really weird history of philosophy. So, I mean, because like the people in it are Hume, Bentham, this obscure American philosopher, I forget what his name is, even is. He has one of these three name names, something, something, something. <laughs> no one has ever heard of him except because Klein talks about this essay. And uh, um, Frege, Russell, and Carnap. That's the, like, that's the history of philosophy. Um, especially, like, okay, I mean, Bentham, yes, people have heard of him. Of course, but he's not usually mentioned in the context of the history of epistemology. I mean, that's not right. He was he was interested in you know, utilitarian like legal systems and stuff like that. Right? Um, so, uh, um, and on the other hand, if you were to tell us, us if you were normally to tell a story of the history of epistemology leading up to Carnap, including if you were Carnap and you needed to tell it, you would definitely mention Kant. <laughs> but Kant is not present in this story. Right? So, um, okay. So anyway, so here's the story. The story starts with Hume. And Hume, so the story is Hume ha wanted to do this thing that Carnap, that uh, Quine is saying the classical epistemologist wanted to do. I guess in the background, he does mention this at one point, only by an adjective. He mentions Descartes, right? It's like the Cartesian project or something, right? So I guess like somewhere in the background is the idea that, that, that Descartes tried to do this first and you know, thought he had succeeded, but like he doesn't say anything about that. So we start with Hume. Hume wanted to do this. Um, he figured out what he thought was a good way to do this. Yeah. Is there a reason why like long hair and like author like like Hume so much? You know, I feel like if he's always mentioned like in the business, for example, he's always brought up with some. Yeah. Well, I mean. Like, so on the one hand, Kant really liked Hume, right? I mean, so uh, it's not there, whereas although Hegel did not. So uh, like, that's, uh, you know, Kant was very respectful, uh, interested in, influenced by both the British empiricists and the continental rationalists. After Kant, German philosophy, at least the post Kantian stream of German, German philosophy kind of turned against the empiricists. So it's, I mean, so it's, I, I guess I would say it's not such, so much a question of why do people like Hume, because, like, with some exceptions, everyone likes Hume. 
that here was really important. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, but like, why Hume and not Kant is more the question, I think. But I, you know, and well, like, um, um, one thing to notice about Klein's history of philosophy is that except for for Frege and Carnap, who get naturalized, it's all English speaking philosophers. It's like it's not in German. There's a lot of reading in German. Well, no, he knew German. He knew, remember, he went to live with Carnap. And, yeah, he knew German. I mean, his German was not perfect, I guess, but he corresponded with Carnap in German. Yeah. No, it's not about. Uh, I mean, so like maybe if you ask why do people now, I don't even know if it's true that people now know how to say. Yeah, like, I mean, I have a hard time answering the question of why would people like Hume so much? I mean, I like him a lot too, but I would like, I don't know. I guess I would, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> if you had to choose a philosopher to have over for dinner, he seems like he'd be a good. <laughs> It's true, he was kind of racist, but uh, not as much as Kant, so <laughs> not nearly as much. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I I mean, th this isn't completely a digression because it's, you know, like it is related to what I said, what I said, what I like, find and feel like or suggest about what he said, but it's maybe too big a question to say any more about. I hope that would be somewhat helpful. <laughs> so, anyway, so, so the story about Hume is that, like, um, I can't resist. Another good question would be why don't people why don't people like British empiricists after him? What were they again? What? What were the British empiricists? Yeah, see, you don't even know who they were. <laughs> well, you probably heard of Mill, John Stuart Mill. That's probably the only one you've heard of. Hey. But there was his father, James Mill, and there was the Scottish Common Sense School of Philosophy. Thomas Reed, Dougal Stewart, uh, Thomas Brown, William Hamilton, Mary Shepherd. <laughs> so yeah, they were uh, British empiricism down and end with you. Uh, all right. Well, anyway, sorry. Uh, back to Quine. Back to Quine's story about Hume. So Quine's story about Hume is that he wanted to do this, and he attacked this part of it by saying, "Well." Um, I mean, I guess so. Like before he even starts the story, Klein asks, "So which terms are clear and distinct already?" And he's, he said, he basically he seems to think there are two kinds of terms that are clear and distinct already: the terms of logic and observation terms. Terms of logic. Uh, why those? I mean, that's actually a good question about one. Like, it's really at some level hard to understand. He does think logic is really, really important. But observation terms, so we can kind of rate, which is more important for this side of the story, because he was, you know, um, he says epistemologists have mostly been interested in this problem. Take the terms we have that refer to bodies. It's a little weird in 1968 to think that physics, the physical world consists of bodies. It's like a 17th century. <laughs> but that's, yeah, that's what he says. So, you know, the terms we have that, I'll get you in a second, that we have to refer to bodies. Um, and the question is how to translate them into observation terms, plus logic. Plus, he said, I regret to add set three. Right. So, never mind that one. So the point is, like, so how is Hume, how did Hume do that, supposedly? He just said, oh, let's say bodies are sense data. <laughs> so all our observation terms, I guess maybe I shouldn't say observation terms, like sense data terms, right, is what Quine is talking about at this point. All our sense data terms are the same as all our terms for 
files. So like this table is the same as my impressions of brown and black and whatever. That's how he saw, wanted to solve this part. And then he got to this part and he realized that, oops, even after doing that, it still wouldn't work. And uh, he despaired of solving it. Yeah, what was your question? Oh, it was like the lost that theory. Like, why does he hate that theory? I think the like very, very not nice. I might say something about that later. But yeah, I mean, it's he he definitely hates the idea that set theory is part of logic, or that anything that's equivalent to set theory is part of logic. So, like, if you say, you know, instead of saying This is first order logic. So this, this, the, by the way, the ten, the orders here are. This is from like 14th century scholastic logic. That's where the term order comes from. But I mean, never mind that. This is first order logic. But you know, that means there is some x that is a. But like, maybe you might want to say this. There is some property such that X has that property. This is higher order logic, <laughs> right? So, so client says, this is just set theory in disguise. You brought set theory. Because you said there exists something that's not an individual, but a property that many individuals share. What is that a set? <laughs> Roughly speaking, that's that's his, you know. So yeah, he's so he hates the idea, and you know, Carnap does a ton of this in the alpha, this kind of quantification. I think Carnap like set theory, he treats that as like quasi objects, so it's okay, you know, just like trying to verify properties there. So it should be okay for like you won't get involved with it. Okay, yeah. I mean, you know what? There's a we could go on about this for a long time, but yeah, basically, like it's a question of um so Quine um, felt that the no class theory, right? Russell's theory in which you could eliminate all the names for sets didn't really work. So, I mean, it's partly technical reasons, but it's partly a question about what eliminating a certain kind of entity amounts to. From Quine's point of view, if, uh, if you have a quantifier that ranges over a certain type of entity, that's when you are committed to the existence of that entity. I mean, look, you just said it exists. Whereas for Carnap's point of view, at least in the alpha, it's, you know, once you can get it in this form, it doesn't have the name of a particular set in it. It feels like the sets have been eliminated, right? So it's partly an argument about what, you know, what elimination is and what the purpose of it is. And, you know, it's complicated. So, you know, um, but, so that's why he, he's upset about, about set theory sneaking in under the auspices of logic. But he has reasons not to like, remember, Goodman also doesn't like set theory. Sets was on, it, on his list of unacceptable entities. Goodman and Klein agreed about that. Um, however, it might not be the same reason they don't like it. So yeah, I might <laughs> getting behind it. I might get to say more about that later on, but I'm gonna finish the main part of the argument here on the, the history, right? So that so the history is that Hume thought he had been able to do this part. Um, you know, he did it by drastic means. Um, but nevertheless, he still wasn't able to do this part because it turned out that even if you translate my sentence, like there's a table here into you know, I have brown impressions and black impressions and whatever, that then when I want to say something like, there will be a table there in five minutes, um, I still have no way of proving it. Right? Or if I want to say something like, all tables are brown, it's not true, but let's say I wanted to say all tables are brown, 
they, there's no possible way of proving that from individual sentences. Like I see I have a brown impression here and I have a black impression here, right? So this part still didn't make it possible to do this part. All right, I mean, and again, like it's very unclear whether Hume ever tried to do anything like what is, is described. It's, it, it certainly would require a huge effort in translating what he actually says in the way it defines terms. But okay, so that's Quine's, and also I guess you should notice right away how different Quine's Hume is from Goodman's Hume. Goodman's Hume was doing something similar to this, but succeeded. <laughs> it's only the smug later people who don't realize that he succeeded. <laughs> Whereas Quine's Hume was trying to do this and failed and despaired and doing it and was, was sad. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, um, So, so then, so I mean, so Quine has a few steps in between about Bentham and whatever, right? Which, but the main point is when we get to the Aufbau, he says, so Carnap um, knew, already knew this, already knew that this part could work. And that's why the Aufbau is only an attack on this part. I mean, it's also weird. That's also weird because in the alpha, remember, Carnap says that an axiomatized system has to have both these parts, but he's only working on this part. Right? He doesn't say an axiomatized system ideally would have both these parts, but unfortunately, this part's impossible, so I'm working on this part. Actually, actually, what he what he says is because people have already worked a lot on this part, but lots of attention has been given to this part, which is so important. I'm going to work on this part. So, uh, but anyway, so, so, um, so, but according to Quine, Carnap following Hume has given up on this part. And now Quine is puzzled. <coughs> Says, why spend so much energy on attacking this part if, you know, because before we understood why this was important, because if we could get all our sentences to be clear and distinct then it would be easier to prove them. But if we've given up on the, pro on the project of proving all our senses from obvious self-evident ones, um, why go to all this trouble? Right, this is on page 74. Um, What then could have motivated Carnap's heroic efforts on the conceptual side of epistemology when hope of certainty on the doctrinal side was abandoned? So, um, so he does, I mean, he gives some reasons for it. Um, um, I mean, he gives basically two reasons. One is that, that, you know, this would help to explain, like as he puts, elicit and clarify the sensory evidence for science. And the other reason was that such constructions would are deepen our understanding of our discourse about the world. Right, so like, so basically one answer is, well, it still makes sense to do this because even though we can't get certainty here, there is still a relationship between evidence and scientific theories and by you know clearing up the conceptual side we can see what kind of evidence there is even if it doesn't come to certainty yes i don't get why quine like 
kind of insists that Hugh gave up on the doctrinal side of things because I don't know, at least in Goodman, it kind of seems like uh, Hume did have an understanding of like predict, predicting things and um, like relying on what has worked in the past to uh, like predict an observation of something that's gonna happen in the future. Yeah, well, I mean, so first of all, as I pointed out, Quine, Quine and Goodman clearly don't interpret Hume in the same way. Um, and as far as which one is a better interpretation of Hume, I mean, they're both kind of weird interpretations. Right, I mean, that, but as I pointed out, Goodman's interpretation of Hume is kind of weird because Hume does sound like he is upset about something, that he despairs of something. They would have liked to be able to do. But uh, Klein's interpretation is weird because um, Hume never said, I mean, first of all, Hume doesn't, Hume sounds like Barton. <laughs> right? Hume never says that, that I talk about bodies, it's just talk about sense impressions. Um, that's, you know, what he actually says is really complicated, but it doesn't include that. So, yeah, I mean, they're both weird interpretations of Hume. I don't know which one's better. Uh, but, you know, I mean, this is like, this is also related to the question of why do people think he was so great? Leaving aside the question of, you know, why do they think he's so great? I mean, I mean, that complete, I mean, as I put it this way, Hume is like an authoritative figure in a certain tradition of philosophy. And um, like, the greater authority a figure has in a tradition of philosophy, like the more divergent the interpretations of the whole thing. <laughs> so, like, I mean, if you compare the way Thomas Aquinas interprets Avicenna to the way he interprets Aristotle or um, Augustine, like, you know, interpretation of Avicenna is pretty straightforward because Avicenna doesn't have to come out right at all. <laughs> Yeah, Aristotle has to come about right about almost everything. Augustine has to base, well, sometimes he actually says, he, he actually takes it upon himself to disagree with Augustine. But for the most part, you know, I have to be really careful of disagreeing with the saint. He wasn't the saint himself yet. <laughs> right. so, that happened much later. And anyway, I mean, long after he died. Right. So, um, yeah, so I mean, it's it, in a way, it's not surprising that we see strange interpretations of Hume here. They're using Hume for a certain purpose. Um, I mean, it's also similar to the fact that we see strange interpretations of the Constitution of the United States, strange interpretations of the Bible. <laughs> right. Okay. Anyway, back to this. So. Uh, Right, so the two reasons are, like I said, that, you know, first of all, yeah, we're still interested in the relation, in the relation, in like what the nature of the evidence for scientific theories is, even if we don't actually have certainty, of, you know, a relation of implication between the evidence and the theory. And the other is that this is basically worthwhile in its own right, right? So this would serve to, to like clarify and deepen our understanding of our discourse. So even if we couldn't be more certain than we were before, at least we would know what we were talking about. Um, but it's after having given that ex like explanation of what Carnap could be thinking, why is he doing this when this part of his fail, that um, I think um, it's at that point that the question becomes relevant, and it is on the next page, page 75. Um, but why all this creative reconstruction, all this make believe? The stimulation of his sensory receptors is all the evidence anybody had to go on ultimately in arriving at his picture of the world. Why not just see how this construction really proceeds? Why not settle for psychology? Right, so like, um, 
if you want to know what we're talking about in the sense of like what evidence made us say what i guess <laughs> or um if you want to know what the relationship between evidence and scientific theory is um why not just ask psychology so um Psychology doesn't actually know very much about this, thing. <laughs> but, uh, but, it, but in principle, if anyone knew about it, it would be psychologists, yes. I feel like um, if we take quantum interpretation of Karnak to be correct, that the doctrinal side is uh, completely abandoned. And I feel like, you know, Karnak's like, goal of unity of science would not work if, it, if all sciences are like metamorphic. Yeah, as I, I'm going to get back to, to the unity of science, at least I, I hope to. Um, all right, so um, so like the way I understand the situation now is that you know, so which sentences we emit. <laughs> Or which sentences will assent to when proposed to us, right? So, like, so, so, like, one basic situation is, you know, uh, the linguist is trying to learn our language and sits down across the table from us and says, "Okay, would you say this? Would you say this? <laughs> would you say this?" How they figured out how to say "would you say"? I don't know. That's a pretty, but like, anyhow, somehow they convey to us. That, that we're supposed to tell them yes or no, and we have a way of doing that. Um, and but like obviously, you know, uh, see, I mean, why is this obvious? But anyway, it's obvious to Quan at least that. Which times we say yes and which times we say no ultimately is related to the pattern of sensory experiences we have. Um, so, uh, um, so if you were able to follow the path from the sensory experiences, all the sensory experiences I've had through the way whatever happens from my brain and blah blah blah, and then you know signals go to my mouth and out from the word yes, that um, like this would be the what really happens in the conceptual side. Right, like this is the real story about how the meaning of what I say about block use or anything else is related to my sense data. I don't know what all these lines signify. <laughs> I just did like it was complicated to feel out of lines. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, So, so by the way, it, so when he, when he says, you know, why all this may believe, he's saying, why do rational reconstruction? I mean, he, he says that in so many words. I'm not, but, but, but that is what it also, that's what it means, right? The, 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 the point of rational reconstruction, according to Carnap, was again, I don't care about the, how the, psychologically speaking we actually you know determine that this is a pine tree based on our sensory experiences or a Klein's version you know how how i come to have the disposition to say yes when you say is this a pine tree <laughs> based on my sensory experiences you know there's some way with, that it really happens but Karnap just wants to know how in principle we could <laughs> Um, you know, just by observing our, our fundamental experiences and the fundamental relation between them, come up with a statement that can be translated into this is a pine tree. 
meaning it has the same truth conditions. It's true that is, I would assent to it whenever I would assent that this is a prime truth and vice versa. So um, that right, that's the creative make belief. It's, I mean, however it is that I determine something as a pine tree, as Quine points out, it's certainly not that, right? I don't use, like, I don't consider all my experiences I've had throughout my life, write down lists of them that are related by the fundamental relation, and then do all these complicated stuff, theoretic things, <laughs> and at the end, grind out a huge long sentence, and then translate it into this is a pine tree, and, and that's why I assent to it, right? I mean, however it works, it's not like that at all. <laughs> People know how to tell, you know, that there's a red ball on the table, even though they've never studied logic and, you know, or whatever, right? So, um, um, so, so Klein says, you know, like, Given that uh, this is what we're doing, what reason would we have for coming up with this make believe account rather than looking for the real account? Um, and he says, by the way, if you we were still trying to do this part, you could think of a good reason, right? Because if we're still trying to do this part, then if the things it says in psychology textbooks about you know the way the brain works and whatever or neuropsychology textbooks, I can't know. Anyway, if the thing if the things the psychologist tells us are not among the self-evident obvious sentences, then uh, we don't want to use them. Um, if we beg the question, that's those are among the things we're going to need to prove. But uh, Wine says, but we gave up on this part. So why not just use whatever information we have to do this part? Um, I mean, we won't be certain we're right, but we just found out we can't be certain we're right. And he plays Hume proof that we have to be skeptical about these two. <laughs> so, uh, well, actually, you see, Hume's proofs in the end end up with, with the result that it's not just that you're not quite certain, which everyone, Ray, like Locke or anyone would say, yeah, I'm not completely certain that this table will be here in five minutes. It just has a high probability. Hume ends up with saying, like, you have no reason to say it at all, or it doesn't even make sense in some way, or, you know, like really bad results like that. But again, Quine's not talking about that. So, um, so uh, he says, well, there's one reason why we would still be interested in rational reconstruction rather than psychology. And he says, that would be if um, by doing this part, we want to show that our theoretical terms are quote unquote innocent. Um, because they're dispensable, right? Like, so um, if I use this word table and it doesn't refer to anything I'm immediately conscious of, whatever that is, you might ask, why do you have the right to use that word? You don't know what you're talking about. Maybe. Suspicious. It's not innocent. But if I can translate it in such a way as to get rid of that word, and it turns out that an equivalent sentence only talks about my own experiences, then you say, oh, okay, so I guess like it's all right to go on talking about tables because you're not really. Um, None of the things you're saying really require you to know anything except about your own experience. 
And that can be shown by, or could in principle be shown by rational reconstruction. Why it says it couldn't be shown by psychology. Why? Again, because psychology will tell you that that's not how I, you know, that's not what actually goes on in my mind when I talk about the table. When I think about the table, I don't actually translate, right? Like, I don't, I, I didn't learn what this is a table means by learning some long, complicated statement. Yeah. Sorry. I mean, I just like when you say that, I just think that, uh, yeah, we didn't learn that. Like, that process, like, are ready to do that process, but before we are there, like, we just need to see tables, like, something's happening because they're going to, they only have to do their routine, and they're going to do that, so the process has to do it, it's going to be there. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. Um, Um, I mean, and I don't think Quine would be, I don't think Quine would deny, I mean, when he goes on to talk about his own just like naturalized product of epistemology, he says one of the advantages is now we don't have to worry about whether you're conscious of these steps or not. Whereas he says, Rational reconstruction requires awareness. And, and, I, and I put a question mark next to that in my book. <laughs> I, a long time ago, I found it, you know, again, when I was reading it this time. Um, so, yeah, why does he think that it would have to be? Because I, I think, yeah, he would agree that, you know, the self, whatever goes on subconsciously or pre-consciously might be somehow equivalent to I mean it might not be probably isn't actually I mean, it's probably not I mean I think one of the things I think one of the things we've learned in recent years by right, you know the advances in artificial intelligence and how they've happened is that like, if you try to tell, if you try to teach the computer to tell what this is a table by by programming in rules for recognizing tables, it's a really hard problem. If you just give it a bunch of tables, non-tables, you know, like in those uncaptured things, <laughs> right? Then, like somehow, you know, without actually having a rule that, that you could, without actually being able to translate what it's doing into, into a rule, it, it manages to learn how to, and then, you know, that's probably, our vision probably works more like that too, right? Like so. Rational or like, that's the that's the best thing that can find it to all like evidence. It's yeah. just like, um, It's just like a structure evolves that gives the right output, <laughs> but it doesn't do it by, by going through steps that you could identify with the steps of those constructions. I think that, I mean, that's my, but, but you're right, like psychology might discover that no, it's the other way, and then why, 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 why I think it can't work. And, uh, I feel like the like, why, like, agree that unit psychology did fine, like rationally constructing the truth, that's the domain of psychology. You know? Tell the methodology of how we arrive at rational uh, observation synthesis for, for client. And I feel like, you know, the issue is issue is less that, you know. I mean, the issue for him is that rational reconstruction of thought, but it's more like, you know, what is right not rely on, but it's subjectivity. That, I think awareness was his critique of, of subjectivity. And whereas, you know, uh, we don't have to be conscious, it's like the fact that we don't have to assume this like a uh, transcend like this subjective perception or subjective perception of it. You know, yeah. where, yeah, so if we just feel psychology, even if rational construction is true, then, you know, it's, it's, it's a different manner environment. 
So I see what you're saying. It doesn't actually it won't proceed from my basic experience. It will proceed from the basic stimulation of my right. Whereas the first thing in my experience might be pine tree. <laughs> yeah. Um, but in the project of showing that it's that our concepts are innocent within, you know, won't work out because they're because our fundamental experiences themselves are innocent. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the right way to look at it. Anyway, so like so so Carl Klein says, you know, it would be a reason to do this if you could show how to eliminate, like how to eliminate all the terms that supposedly refer to bodies in favor of terms that refer to things that we might be immediately aware of. But um, um, and he says. And that's what Carnap thought he could do. And that's what he was trying to do in the Alpha. But uh, the Alpha didn't work. And, you know, I mean, if you ask how can we be sure it didn't work or it couldn't have worked, which is actually a good question, because remember, I told you that Goodman had published a book, The Structure of Appearance. Where he said that the alpha doesn't work, but like let's start a different way and maybe we can make a project like that. <laughs> so I don't know that Goodman ever changed his mind about that, but Klein is saying here that um, yeah, you can see from the alpha that, and by the way, Goodman still describes himself as doing rational reconstruction. Um, but yeah, Klein thinks that this has clearly failed and failed in principle, you know, I mean, he gives two, I guess, pieces of evidence that it failed. One is that Carnap himself and the other positivists, not long after, in 1936, gave up on the project of eliminating the theoretical vocabulary in terms of the, the observational. And so, I mean, we saw various stages of that. He mentions the one from 1936 from testability and meaning, but you know, so and but I mean, so from that you might say, well, maybe they just didn't know how to make it work. And there's a paper by David Lewis called How to Define Theoretical Terms that I think I've mentioned before, where well, he doesn't actually it's funny. He doesn't say he has two sets of terms that he calls O and T, which you might think stand for observation and theory. But he says, I'm going to use this to stand for old. <laughs> right? Like, I don't know if there's observational terms, but whatever terms we had before, we're trying to introduce some theoretical terms now. <laughs> anyway, and he basically like shows how you, yeah, you can always do it. And he makes a lot of use of the definite description out there in higher order of life. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, why well, talk about like, uh, Carnap's like re, like kind of like retreat into like implication of set definition, but didn't necessarily explain why that's wrong. I'm just saying, well, it's not strong enough to be rational construction. So I don't necessarily understand the, the, the reason. Well, behind no, that. I mean, he said, because he said, why would we still want to do the rational reconstruction? Only because we can figure out how to eliminate these suspicious terms in favor of the innocent. Why? I mean, that's Quine's explicit. Like, it's the motivation that Quine is attributing to Carnap in writing the out vow because it's the only motivation that still makes sense according to Quine. So that must be what he was trying to do. But when he retreated to other ways of introducing terms that don't allow you to eliminate them, and Goodman also complains about this. I don't know if you know this, but he also complains about something, something similar. If when you retreat to new ways of introducing terms that don't allow you to eliminate them, then um, you're not going to be able to get rid of the suspicious terms. And so you're not going to be able to show that what you're saying using the suspicious terms is innocent. And so the whole thing is pointless. 
and and like I said, he thinks you can see from what they did that they had that they um, had given up on trying to eliminate the terms. And he also thinks that if you look at what happened in those sections of the alpha where Carnap actually takes the step of introducing bodies that, that we talked about before, that you can see that um, you know Carnap's method won't allow you to eliminate the terms for bodies. So it's, I mean, again, like Carnap actually probably thinks that you, you could eliminate from that way, and they probably don't agree about what eliminate. Yeah, like, elimination, elimination seems like possibly similar to elimination. If you know, like if I have like a term that like A implies B and B implies C, I can, I can, if I wanted to, to just feasibly eliminate the B terms, right? So I, I feel like the, the distinction between elimination and implication isn't very clear to me. Well, it's because just because you still have this term that you know is not. Um, um, it's still going to turn up in all kinds of places where you can't replace it. Right? I mean, all you know, remember that like these these sentences are, are like like um, for all x, cx implies x equivalent to dx. This is the form of the reduction sentences that, that kind of um, introduces in testability and meaning. So this means that if condition C holds, you can eliminate A in favor of B. But all the times when condition C doesn't hold, you still have A. And you're still saying things using A, but you haven't shown what they mean by translating it to B. So if A is the suspicious term, B is the innocent term, your language is still suspicious. So can you, can you like demonstrate the logical character, the logical form of like the implication factor that because I'll but like I see that, but like, can you compare it to the, the implication that the the client talks about? This is the implication that client is talking about. Well, yeah. I, yeah. I mean it, that that under certain circumstances, some sentence using A implies some sentence using B or vice versa. That this is basically what it's talking about. So it's, it's a C element that makes it non reducible because it's not reducible. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, I mean, and like that's just one way of doing it. As we saw later on, it kind of gets the, the relationship gets more and more distant. You're very far from being able to eliminate the theoretical primitives. Right. So, I mean, I think Klein is right about that. So the, the question is like, is it plausible? So 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 why did they keep doing this then? And according to Klein, it's just because they didn't notice that the new way of doing it was worthless for their motivation. And so the entire history of logical positive from 1936 on was just people doing something that was pointless, but they didn't notice it was pointless. This is, you know, not that plausible, maybe, <laughs> right? It might indicate that 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 Klein doesn't have Carnap's motivation, right? And remember, what, like I tried to explain why, from Carnap's point of view, it's not a big deal to give up a limited definition. But um, Okay, but I guess finally, the last thing that's important about Klein's argument is that so not only does he have evidence that these people stop doing almost immediately the only thing that he can see any point of doing, and not only does he have evidence that even in the alpha, the, the way Carnap proceeds couldn't possibly have worked, but he thinks he can explain to you why nothing like this will ever work. And it's because of holism. Um, so, um, the basic idea, and he argues about this 
for this in greater depth or greater uh, at greater length elsewhere. But like the basic idea is that if you have a big scientific theory um, or the totality of all our scientific and I guess also regular everyday knowledge. Again, I think Klein is in this whole tradition that we're talking about the first part of the course, people are not really interested in the distinction between science and like everyday things that we said, right? So, um, but anyway, so like if you take the whole web of human knowledge, so I mean, it is definitely like all the things we say and think are explained by the sensory stimulation that we've had. So Klein says that's obvious empiricism in that sense is definitely true. But the question is whether um, it's possible to isolate certain um, evidence that's evidence for a particular thing that I believe. And so, and Klein says it in general, it isn't. I mean, it's interesting, people often don't notice this, but he says there are some sentences that were that, that do have their own observational or like empirical content. He calls them observation sentences, right? So, like, you know, like there's a pine tree there now, I guess, or something like that is one of those. But in general, if you talk about, you know, like uh, most of the things we say about the world, they don't have their own particular empirical basis because like, so, so suppose these are, the, these are the empirical data that's supposed to imply this proposition P. But now, so suppose one of them would get the opposite instead. So like, so you might think, oh, now P is falsified. I have to give it up. But Klein says, well, you can always, um, or almost always, save P by changing your belief about something else. Um, right, so like, you know, uh, I say momentum is conserved, but then uh, I look in a particle accelerator, you know, and I see this happen. Like one particle goes in here and another particle comes out here and momentum isn't conserved. So I can say, oh, it turns out momentum isn't conserved. Or I can say, oh, it turns out there's another particle that I can't detect if I'm not that. I have to decide which one to set. In this case, and this is interesting because Gibbon also mentions this. In fact, he puts it on his list of unacceptable entities. In this case, people said, um, yeah, there's another particle called a neutrino that has no charge and barely interacts with other particles. And that's why we can't detect it. But it's there and it's carrying off some of the momentum. Um, later on, it became possible to detect the trees and whatever. So I can say it turned out they were right. But I don't know what people would say about that. Oh, but right. So anyway, so the point is like at this point, I could have decided. So if P is the conservation of momentum, and Q is like a list of which particles are there, right? Or like, you know, um, what kind of detector should be able to detect whatever particle is coming out, right? Um, and rather than giving up on the conservation of momentum, I, I give up on Q and replace it by something else. I say, oh yeah, there's one other part. And the claim is that you can basically almost always do Again, except maybe for some senses that are about exactly what I'm seeing right now. Um, and therefore, the project of translating our senses, sentence by sentence, into statements about the empirical evidence is hopeless. 
there is a translation of all our sentences taken together into the, the sensory input we actually have. But at this point, rather than call that a translation, Florence says we can call that like a psychological account of how stimulation by sense data results in um, all the things we say. <laughs> So um, right, so that's the end of part one. <laughs> part one took longer than I wanted to, but partly because there were a lot of good questions. Um, so that's better, I guess. But um, so what I said in part two was going to be about like what kind of attack on Carnap is this? Oh, that's another good question. <laughs> yeah. Does that mean like since why you didn't have to demarcation? Because I understand it. Like let's say what a demark, like I want to say like separate, like let's say like you know, like no chronology. I, I hate that, you know. Yeah, this, that? this is what I'm about to get to. So you're you're anticipating what I'm about to talk about. All right. So like um so uh, what was Carnap's actual motivation for setting up the alpha system? What did, what, what did Carnap think an axiomatized system of uh, like scientific statements would actually be good for? Well, remember, there were two things that Carnap was interested in, the unity of science, and getting rid of metaphysics. And yes, for sure, Wine's new version of the project is not going to be any good for this one. Plus, you know, our my sensory stimulations explain why I say there's a table here. You know, my sensory my sensory stimulations also explain why I say um, this table is metaphysically real. It's mind independent, right? All those things that our ethics are nonsense. But those are also explained somehow by all the sensory stimulation that I've had. Why only sensory stimulation? I guess it's not also explained by why I was born in I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> but sensory stimulation is what Klein says. So, uh, um, you know, the same things that explain my scientific statements are going to explain my metaphysical statements. So, yeah, Klein is giving up on the project of getting rid of metaphysics. Um, I mean, that is, or I think you, another way to put it is that in general, just as it's not going to be possible to say what the empirical content of this statement is, it's not going to be possible to say where there is any empirical content and where there is not. Um, But um, on the other hand, getting back to Carnap, so already in the alpha, Carnap says that for both of these, first of all, he says a constructional system with any basis would already do this one. It doesn't have to be our experiences, right? So he's interested in this for some completely different reason that Quine is not talking about. Right? I mean, what he says pretty soon is that, that this goal of showing the unity of science is going to be accomplished in a physicalistic system only. It's going to have a basis that consists of particles and fields or something like that. 
So, um, um, and as for this one, well, I mean, first of all, Karnak actually does say towards the end of that alpha, I, I don't think I got a chance to, to point this out in lecture, but he actually says that these metaphysical concepts will not fit into any instructional system of science. Not only they won't fit into the uh, epistemically ordered system of the alpha. Now, why, how we can be so sure about that? I don't know. He doesn't explain that. <laughs> But, um, but if you look at the later verses of the system, I think you can see that, well, the reason the metaphysical system uh, concepts won't fit into any constructional system is going to be because the constructional the science that's unified is itself going to tell us that, um, oh yeah, you have to go right. Yeah. That's all. Um, that uh, the science that the unified science is itself going to tell us that you know this statement the metaphysician is making has no empirical implications. Uh, no, maybe not, but anyway, um, uh, so so actually, you know, for whatever reason, Karnak actually says that both reads can be satisfied with any constructional system. Um, but, it, you know, the epistemically ordered one, I guess, is better for showing this. That's why he's doing it, for, for, for showing the difference between science and metaphysics. Um, but how does it show the science difference between science and metaphysics? Well, um, it doesn't do it by introducing some theoretically innocent terms and starting with those. Why do I say that? Because remember, there's that whole thing about the choice of the basis and the outcome. And how are we going to choose the basis? We're going to consult the latest results of Gestalt psychology. So, um, so like the fundamental concepts used in the Aufbau are are um, they're chosen. So, it was right. I guess to put it this way, we, we want to find the things that are directly observable. But directly observable itself, as Putnam points out, but I think Carnap 100% agrees with this, directly observable is a theoretical term of psychology. Hey, right? so when we, you know, when we're thinking about what to use as the basic elements, we're using psychology to choose them. In other words, basically, epistemology is already naturalized <laughs> in alpha. In the sense that um, you know, we're not trying to start with some things that, that everyone would acknowledge are the basic elements of their experience. We're starting with things that psychological experts would acknowledge are the basis of experience. Um, Okay, so what is the point? What's the point of doing this then? Or, or how, does, how does this work? And I mean, um, remember, I argued that, that like what's going on here is that we're manifesting our intention to like show by our own standards that what we're saying is meaningful. You know, we're like accepting a responsibility in some way for the consequences of our statements. And the way metaphysics actually gets eliminated is 
อะไรอย่างนี้ It doesn't get eliminated because we don't have a construction of the metaphysical positions. We don't have an actual construction of the metaphysical terms. Because we don't have a, an actual construction of almost any terms, right? That's the again. This is the thing I kept emphasizing. This is in principle. <laughs> If this system could be completed, and we're waiting for empirical science to give us all kinds of information that we don't have, without which we can't complete it. Um, but also, even with all that information, it would be a really difficult problem. Carnap seems optimistic that it actually could be done. Maybe in the 30s or the late 20s, that actually seemed. I mean, we have learned a lot about how, how hard it is to give rules for things. Like I heard uh, that I should try to find a source of this sometime. But what I heard that the first people working with electronic computers um, were really surprised to discover bugs. Like they thought, you know, we built the computer. Now we tell it what to do, and then we'll do it. They told it what to do, and it did some weird thing that they didn't expect. They didn't realize it's actually really hard to tell the computer what to do. <laughs> you can make a mistake, and it will do something, but not what you wanted. <laughs> and so it will do what you told it to do, but that wasn't what you wanted to tell it to do, right? So like. Um, that was the beginning, I think, of learning how that uh, giving rules for things is really difficult. <laughs> so, uh, so, but anyway, you know, as I say, Carnap certainly didn't think we had it now. You know, so so why is metaphysics different? And I said the difference is because when you when you say to the scientist, um, look, we're working on this project of showing how everything you say. Can be like held responsible to things that, according to science itself, you you directly know about. The scientists will say, "Oh, you know, yeah, that's good. Good luck." If you say when you say to the metaphysician that you're doing that, the metaphysician will say, "No, you completely misunderstood what I'm talking about." Right? Like all the sense data would be the same if this table were dependent on my model. Doesn't make right, the fact that it really exists independently of my mind doesn't make any difference to the sense data. So the metaphysician refuses this project. Um, so, um, Like all we, what we need here is just a translation into a language, or even just an intended translation into a language that makes these relationships clear. It doesn't have to be a reduction to theoretically innocent terms, or it doesn't even have to be an eliminative reduction at all. Um, So, um, okay, so like I've just basically shown that, you know, uh, Kalani's attack on Karnak is, is bad. <laughs> um, so, um, but what can be said in defense of Kwan? So I think something can be said in defense of Kwan, and it's something that I've already said before about some other people, but I think maybe this is the strongest proof of it, namely, The, the strongest instance of it, namely that um, Quine doesn't think doesn't Carnap's real motivation, according to Quine, isn't even a motivation. <laughs> so he attributes to him to another motivation that makes sense. From his point of view, it's like charitable, basically. Why is why so so? In other words, so so. What I'm going to say now is like I guess I would say 
the real basis of why is attack on that. Um, so because Carnap's uh, what Carnap's project is that we should intend to choose a language that will clearly exhibit the difference between metaphysics and science. And we should intend to say the things that can be said in that language or that are clearly not metaphysics in that language in the later versions. And I think Klein's real attack on Karnap is something like um, how can I tell what language you chose? So, I mean, this is like uh, a question that Carnap can't refuse. I, I mean, so like Carnap thinks that he's because he's he's talking outside the bounds of theory. He's talking about a practical question of what language should we choose. That it's okay that you know that they are like this is philosophy. It's not science. This is what's left for philosophy. Science can answer all theoretical questions. But we still have to answer this type of question. What kind of language should we choose? But um, it's a theoretical question, which language we actually chose. That's not a practical question. And yet, if there's no answer to it, then the choice doesn't make sense, <laughs> right? So um, like, if there's no, if, if the question, which language did you cho choose, is a pseudo question, then the choice of language isn't the choice. And I think that's what that's what Klein is really saying here. So, right, so if we go back to like, like a further result of holism, according to Klein, is what he calls the indeterminacy of translation. He says, if you take two languages and assume we have no tradition of translation between these languages. So this, since I'm not going to really have time to get into the political stuff, I'll just like point that out. That, that like Goodman, part of Klein's point is that the way we actually get along in these situations is by our tradition. Right, like the reason we actually can translate German into English back and forth, and there's no uh, indeterminacy in it, is because um, we've been translating German and English into each other forever, and everyone knows how, what the right way to do it is. But he says, take two languages that have never encountered each other before, and. I mean, we still are seeing, as in Neurot, maybe I shouldn't have erased the thing that was on the board when I came in about colonialism or whatever. You know, this one of the languages is our language. And the other language is the language of some tribe. And we send a field members to this tribe. Um, so like this uncontacted by us tribe. And you know, we're trying to translate their sentences. So Klein says, Well, what evidence do we have to go on that we have a good translation? Well, we expose them to various stimuli and say, Let's see what sentences they emit, basically, right? And based on that, you know, we we're, we try to decide like which sentence would we emit in those under those stimulations and make that the translation. But because of holism. There's no saying exactly which sentence was the response to exactly which stimulation, except for maybe a few like really basic observation sentences. So you just as um, in the like um, verification falsification case, you always had a choice of you know keep this and change this or keep or change this and keep this. In the translation case, Klein says, in principle, you're always going to have a choice. You can, you know, you can translate um, a 
given term in any number of ways, and then you just compensate it by changing the translation of all other terms. And it will still come out that what they're saying is, is what we would say more or less in their situation. Right, that, that's basically what we're aiming for the translation. Right, we, we, we want to like, we want the, the translation of what they say in a certain situation to be what we would say in that situation if we had their beliefs of acceptance, right? And so, like, but, there, but there's always, it's going to be completely indeterminate. Um, and I think Quine thinks that's also enough to show that we can't tell which of Quine's language systems we've chosen. Um, in fact, in ontological relativity, which is another paper in the same volume, Quine says, eliminating the colonialist step. He says, and actually this applies to our own language too. We don't know, uh, wait, what are they called? Not the identity translation. The, um, uh, I forget, but the translation where you just translate every sentence by itself. He says, we don't know if that's right. We can choose different. <laughs> so, um, right, so like, I mean, if that's true, then, then Karnak actually is in, you know, an impossible situation. And, and again, I think the crime is attacking him as if he were saying something else, because he's attributing to them the, the, the closest thing that would make sense. So he's actually saying, all right, I'm sorry, I've got two minutes over. And uh, I'll see you Tuesday.